Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Protecting Your Privacy webinar. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about identity theft prevention and how to protect your personal data. My name is Daniel Sines, and I'm a Senior Business Development Officer here at the Los Angeles Police Federal Credit Union. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that this session is a live webinar, and a recording of this webinar will be sent out shortly after. All participants will be in listen-only mode, but presenters will have dedicated time to answer your questions towards the end of the presentation. So we encourage you to ask them along the way by typing into the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen. I'd like to kick off the webinar by first introducing our guest speakers. Tonight, we're honored to have Russ Tabler and Jordan Jackson from Sontic, a transunion company. They will talk about important identity theft services available for LAPFCU members and ways to safeguard against fraud. We also have Wade Luthi, the information security engineer at LAPFCU. Wade has 12 plus years of IT and cybersecurity experience and is passionate about educating others about the importance of personal technology and data security. Our goal for tonight is to discuss identity theft prevention, I'm sorry, protection, threat trends, identify theft solutions, protecting your financial data, avoiding scams, and common red flags. At this time, I'd like to pass the mic to Russ and Jordan. Thanks, Daniel, appreciate that. Uh, so to introduce myself, my name is Russ Tabler. Uh, I'm an account manager at Sontic, a transunion company. Uh, Jordan and I are thankful for the opportunity to speak with everyone this evening. Uh, to get started, I'd just like to give you some brief background on our organization. Uh, Sontic offers identity protection, cyber insurance, and incident response solutions to secure the identities of our members. Uh, Sontic is now part of one of the three major credit bureaus after we were acquired by TransUnion in 2021. Uh, now, Jordan and I are lucky enough to work with some industry leaders in the identity protection and cybersecurity space. We've paired with our research and content marketing teams to put together some information about what we've seen in 2023 and what we expect to see in 2024. We hope to provide you with some knowledge and tools that you can take to better protect your digital safety and security. Uh, so most people think of identity theft simply as credit theft, such as opening a credit card or loan in your name. Uh, while this is still occurring at a pretty alarming rate, these types of fraud are generally fairly simple to resolve and can be handled within a phone call or two. In reality, we're seeing more diverse attacks than ever before. On your screen, you're gonna see some of the most common case types that were handled by our resolution center in 2023. Um, now, one you may not be as familiar with is synthetic identity theft. This is when somebody takes components from multiple individuals. They might use your social, someone else's name, or excuse me, someone else's address, and then pair that with a fake name, essentially creating a brand new identity. Uh, now, this can be a lot more difficult to catch, but just as damaging. This, of course, is a busy time of year for us processing claims related to tax fraud. Upon filing, taxpayers may experience rejection of tax returns if someone has used their social or taxpayer ID fraudulently. They may even discover unexpected income streams, including unemployment payments. Now, unemployment fraud, uh, this was uh, basically non-existent before the pandemic, but it really took off in 2020 and has not gone away. Scammers will use PII or personally identifiable information to apply for unemployment benefits. Uh, this can then trigger a wave of issues from paycheck garnishments, unemployment issues, tax implications. Uh, and of course, this can be even worse if a victim loses their job and needs to employ needs to apply for unemployment themselves, the claim will get rejected as payments have already been made to the individual. Senior fraud scams are also at an all-time high. While many believe that this part of the population is less likely to embrace new technologies, we have found that seniors are just as willing to use social media and have an online presence. Uh, but they can maybe be a bit too trusting and are less life likely to sniff out what some may notice as an obvious scam. Uh, and of course, medical ID theft. This is a huge risk because quite frankly, a lot of hospitals might not have the extensive security system as say your bank. Uh, fraudsters will then use the PII of a victim to purchase prescription drugs 
maybe even see a doctor and have a procedure done, leaving you stuck with the bill. Now, why are these types of fraud on the rise? Well, since the pandemic, we've seen a very sharp increase in data breach events. It's important to understand this because really, no matter how careful we are with safeguarding our information, a lot of this can be out of our hands. Uh, if someone really does want your information, uh, they can probably get it as these breaches are only happening more frequently. So it becomes increasingly important to make sure you educate yourself. Then we can move to the next slide. So the simplest place to start is to note that 2023 smashed the record for most data breaches in a single year. Uh, the previous record was set in 2021 with over 1,860 data breach events and 2022 being just behind it. Uh, last year did outpace both of these, uh, both of those by a considerable amount, recording more than 2,000 incidents by the end of September. Uh, now, we are still in the process of finalizing year-end stats after the close of the fourth quarter, but over 3,000 compromises were reported last year. Uh, now, keep in mind, this is 3,000 breached organizations or companies. The information exposed impacted millions. So when you combine advances in technology, along with having all this information for identity thieves and cyber criminals to use, it's easy to see how identity theft and fraud are at an all-time high. Uh, so now that I've given you some information about what we saw last year, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, who's going to give you some information about the threats and trends we expect to see in 2024. Thanks for that preface, Russ. Uh, <clears throat> so with these most recent 2023 stats in mind, I'd like to piggyback off of uh, a few points and really discuss four major threat trends in the fraud and cybersecurity space uh, that we believe deserve a significant amount of attention in 2024. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, so the first point is really a direct result of the number of breaches that occurred in 2023, and uh, that has a lot to do with how criminals will be abusing that stolen PII or person, personally identifiable information that Russ mentioned. Uh, based on the data that was exposed, we expect threat actors, and when I say threat actors, I mean both those are who are financially motivated, uh, as well as uh, politically motivated nation states to drive new levels of identity crime in 2024. In particular, really, we expect to see an increase in uh, synthetic identity fraud and impersonation attacks. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, synthetic identity fraud really occurs when an identity thief takes bits and pieces of personal information from many different people. And often what they do is they combine it with fake information to create a new identity that they can use in their legal schemes. So for example, uh, they might combine a fictitious name with a real social security number and address, uh, a random date of birth and other elements. Uh, and then in turn, these, these synthetic identities can be used to open fraudulent loans or lines of credit. Uh, the real issue here is because some of the information is real, it makes it very difficult to detect the fraud when it occurs. Uh, I mentioned uh, impersonation scams, and this is something that occurs when a fraudster contacts a victim pretending to be someone else in order to steal money or maybe gather valuable uh, personal information. What they might do is they might claim to be someone who is a known or trusted source, such as a family member in trouble, uh, perhaps a tech support agent uh, reaching out for help, or maybe even something as extreme as an IRS agent stating that, uh, you know, you must make a payment or, or face serious consequences by X date. The real issue is, is that these scammers can be extremely convincing when armed with the right personal details about an individual. Uh, really, we've seen a significant increase in social, social engineering attacks recently, uh, specifically based on what we've seen, cyber claims stemming from social engineering attacks comprised of 50% of all claims in 2023. And just for reference, that's a stat that barely topped 20% in 2021. Uh, there are a few reasons why criminals are increasingly using these kinds of attacks. Uh, criminals generally like tactics that are difficult to trace, and social engineering provides more anonymity than attacks like ransomware, which could potentially be tracked. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. One of the other trends uh, we expect to see next year is criminals continuing to leverage new AI technologies, uh, especially when they can leverage that stolen PII that I mentioned before. Uh, in reality, we see the potential for targeted attacks on single individuals or small groups of people, and we think that that risk will be underestimated. 
the real reason being is the availability of comp comprised uh, consumer data and the use of what's called LLMs or large language models, which these AI, uh, these AI platforms are built off of. And they'll likely generate some very convincing fraud. A uh, perfect example of this is a fraudster could enter someone's stolen PII into an LLM AI engine uh, to create highly convincing medical records, quote unquote, uh, that could in turn be submitted to insurance carriers. Uh, another real use case that we expect to see is a rise in the use of AI to trick authentication technologies by stealing real biometric data. Um, in fact, TransUnion's Global Fraud Solutions team observed a significant uptick uh, in biometric and deepfake oriented crime during 2023. Uh, Moreover, the ease of access and relative affordability of these generative AI programs will likely motivate fraudsters to feed these machines with more identity data, uh, in turn prompting them to steal more biometric data that can be used for what is known as voice cloning and deep fakes. Uh, now, this data may come from audio and video recordings of things like webinars and presentations, such as this one that we're on uh, together now. Uh, smart speaker audio files, uh, things like call center records, voicemails, uh, personal videos posted on social media, or even online dating sites. And as far as how widespread these attacks will be, uh, we think they'll likely follow a similar trajectory as ransomware. Now, early adopters of these AI-powered schemes will likely start with bigger targets or people known as whales, uh, you know, generally more financially influent uh, influential people, uh, but the attacks will become more commonplace as, as uh, the, te the technology evolves and it starts to circulate amongst these criminals. Up next slide, please, Daniel. Uh, now criminals are expected to eagerly adopt new technologies and our, our team expects companies to deploy more advanced, uh, advanced authentication processes uh, just to lock down their systems as a response. Uh, a great example of this is the adoption of uh, MFA or OTP or multi-factor authentication um, and the use of one-time passcodes in tandem with the use of biometric data over the last few years. Uh, as cyber criminals increasingly use AI for more convincing fraud and deepfakes, organizations are really going to have to t uh, make identity management and authentication even more central to their defenses. One of the technologies that companies are increasingly offering, uh, and which is a best practice for many consumers to use, is multi-factor authentication, which I mentioned before. And while the good news is people are increasingly using MFA to protect their accounts and data, criminals have unfortunately caught on. As a result, we expect to see MFA bypass attacks to be the credential thief's go-to approach in 2024. Uh, and fortunately, 2023 saw these crooks hone their skills in for intercepting email, uh, SMS slash text communication, MFA authentication, and even the one-time passcode app authentication. Uh, once they have access to a victim's email or text traffic, Cyber criminals could essentially intentionally trigger MFA communications to the authentication method to access the account or environment. Uh, we expect this back and forth with uh, the attackers to lead companies to adopt more phishing resistant MFA solutions like pass keys and the use of uh, FID02 keys. While the business side infrastructure to support pass keys may still have some updating required before consumers and individuals can adopt that type of technology, large organizations like your Googles, Amazons, and Ubers uh, and others are making pass keys the default method of logging into their services uh, as opposed to passwords generated by individuals. Uh, that's going to essentially force adoption in the market for the use of these pass keys. Next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, we also think uh, that kind of continuous evolution of technology will be seen mirrored in the attitudes towards cybersecurity. In fact, uh, just as the world of credit was transformed by giving consumers more visibility and control, we expect attitudes toward digital privacy to follow a similar path this year. Uh, consumers expect privacy and control over their data, and our insights team says we are on the cusp of significant transition of power in favor of the consumer. In response, uh, U.S. regulators are starting to catch up to public sentiment with state level regulations like the California Consumer Privacy Act moving to really protect consumers' personal information. Unfortunately, while there may have been some momentum at the federal level previously, we do not believe Congress will move on federal legislation in 2024. Really, there just seems to be too much gridlock at the moment, which has pushed digital privacy to the back burner. 
So that's a very fast look uh, at four trends that the analysts at TransUnion Consumer Interactive believe we'll be seeing in 2024. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Russ to briefly discuss uh, some of the actions you can take to protect and respond to incidents uh, concerning fraudulent activity. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those insights, Jordan. Um, now, I would just like to spend uh, a couple of minutes uh, just providing you all with some of the some information about the resources that are available to all members of your credit union. Um, first is going to be access to free identity theft resolution support. Uh, so if you're ever made aware of a fraud risk, maybe you receive a letter in the mail about an account you didn't apply for. Uh, maybe you uh, accidentally fell for a phishing scam, gave your social away uh, on a on a phone call. We'll then pair you up with a certified resolution specialist to work with one on one. Uh, this rep is going to handle all steps to return you back to pre theft status. They'll be able to write letters for you, make phone calls for you, file disputes on your behalf, work with any financial institutions or government agencies on your behalf, really do whatever type of legwork or heavy lifting is required to remediate the fraud. Uh, our team consists of 100% Santic employees located in the United States. And they are available 24 7 365. you'll be able to think of the person you work with more so as a case manager than a call center rep uh, you're not going to be passed around from person to person you will work with the same specialist start to finish uh, they'll be able to research the issue for you in between calls provide you with updates along the way uh, and most importantly you're not going to need to explain yourself over and over again if more than one call is required uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, early detection uh, really is key when it comes to limiting your fraud exposure. We address this by providing a wide range of alerts to our members to red flag suspicious activity. Uh, now, all of our monitoring packages are available to credit union members at a discounted rate. Uh, we will notify you if we find anything from criminal activity in your name, uh, changes to address records, activity on your financial accounts, uh, and of course, new applications submitted in your name. We do also provide traditional dark web monitoring, uh, but with a cool enhancement to it. Dark web monitoring, which you may be familiar with, it's been around for uh, about 20 years or so. Generally, after a breach occurs, the information is then sold on the dark web to the criminals who use it for fraud. Dark web alerts are going to show you when your personal information or financial data has been exposed on the dark web. The alerts are going to say something like your social has been exposed through this website and you might be left not knowing exactly what to do about it. So to fill this gap, we offer a service known as Breach IQ. Our AI based algorithm is going to break down each event, let you know the severity of the breach, let you know what information was compromised and provide you with a set of personalized action steps to take based on the data that was exposed. Uh, there also is gonna be a breach risk score associated with each event. Uh, if your social and credit card number were exposed, for example, that's gonna be a high risk score with an extensive set of steps that should be taken to protect yourself. If your email address and phone number are exposed, that's gonna be a low risk score the resolution steps might be as simple as changing a password. We'll also provide you with an aggregate score based on the sum of your breach history. Uh, this is just a nice feature to have, you know, while a lot of people understand their information is out there, not everyone knows what to do about it. This allows us to be a lot more proactive in our monitoring approach. Uh, we also, of course, offer credit monitoring as credit-based fraud does remain prevalent. Uh, so through your Sonic account, we'll provide you with copies of your credit reports along with real-time alerts when any inquiries or changes occur in your report. Uh, so the benefit of this is simple. Rather than finding out about a fraudulent account uh, after it's opened in your name, after the balance has gone up, after your credit score has gone down, you're going to get an alert from us the moment the application is processed. Uh, you also will have the ability to lock your credit report directly through our dashboard or app. Uh, and of course, if suspicious activity ever is detected, you'll be able to open up a case with one of the fraud specialists mentioned earlier to remediate the issue. Uh, now that's about all that Jordan and I have for you. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna pass it over to Wade. Yep, 
Evening all, just give me one moment, please. Sorry about that, if you guys can all bear with me. I am having uh, quite severe seasonal allergies, but I think we'll be able to get through this just fine. As I said, uh, good evening. My name is Wade Luthie. I'm the Information Security Engineer here at LAPFCU. Uh, my role here is developing and implementing cybersecurity policies and safeguarding all business and member data. Uh, I also protect our digital environment against potential threats on a daily basis. Uh, using a variety of systems and tools. Uh, if you've seen The Matrix or Swordfish, I pretty much invented all that awesome stuff. And I'm obviously kidding. It's not that flashy. But it is still fun. And it is, uh, it's is—it's a great thing to do. Uh, in this slide here, uh, we have some very simple methods to help protect you against uh, financial data loss. One of my personal goals with teaching this information uh, you know, regarding an account protection and data loss is trying to keep things as simple as possible by delivering what I feel is the core important habits for protecting yourself and your data and your accounts uh, in this digital age. Uh, it may seem like uh, there are many complex level to what is, you know, being hacked or what is being compromised. Uh, but really, a lot of it is not that complicated. Oftentimes, compromised accounts or loss of information or identity theft is very simple methods of uh, social engineering or, you know, easy passwords being guessed or, you know, it's very rarely uh, exploiting minor issues in various systems that we use to uh, manage our accounts and personal information. Uh, so in this slide here, we have what I call the personal security trifecta. Uh, it's very simple. You always craft a secure password, always utilize MFA or 2FA, which is multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication. Uh, and then, of course, try and learn the common red flags with suspicious websites or emails. Hopefully your eyes didn't cross with all that information. Um, I'm going to try and break it down a little bit here. Uh, for the first one with the passwords, I would say it's pretty simple. Um, most of the time when you go to websites, they only require a 9 to 12 character password. I recommend that you always try to get to 12 or 14 if they'll let you. Uh, and a few basic rules of thumbs, uh, the smaller the password, the more randomized it should be. If you're going to have a six to nine digit password, I would uh, try and randomize those characters between letters, numbers, and uh, symbols. If you can get to 12 or 14, you would still do the same using upper and lowercase uh, uh, letters as well as numbers and symbols. but. Uh, it's best to try and create a phrase because it creates more uh, chances to use uh, various characters and digits, but it's also a little easier for you to remember while also trying to keep it complex. So as you can see here, there's a small example. Uh, if you read it, it says this was fun, but it's alphanumeric and it's using that combination of uh, upper and lowercase letters, numbers and symbols. The next on the list is the MFA or the 2FA. Again, that's multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication. Uh, this has been coming out very quickly in the past couple of years. It's really been ramping up over the past five years as a whole. Uh, and it's because this is arguably one of the strongest defense mechanisms against protecting your accounts and information. Anytime you have an account anywhere on the internet, if they offer this, uh, uh, this feature, you absolutely should enable it. This feature is like, uh, it's like when, you, in, when you're watching the movies, uh, like a 007 movie or something, and they have biometric locks where somebody comes up to the door and they get their eye and their fingerprint scanned along with typing in a password. This would be the equivalent to that. Instead of just requiring your password, they're also requiring a secondary measure for you to authenticate who you are and prove that's you. When you enable 2FA or MFA, you're oftentimes enrolling your cell phone number so they can text you a code or they will enroll you in an authentication app that provides you a code. Uh, another benefit to using MFA or 2FA is if anybody attempts to access your account, you're going to know about it because in order to get that final sign off and get into your account, the code is going to be sent to you. So if you get that code and you know you're not attempting to log into your account, then you know somebody else is trying to and you can immediately contact the proper administrator uh, to let them know somebody's trying to compromise your account. Excuse me. 
Finally, uh, finally here, we have the understanding email and website safety. I can't go too in depth here, but I'm gonna do my best to try and generalize the details here. Uh, the, when dealing with emails and websites, they are often designed the same and handled the same with the information that's in them. Uh, without question, very often these suspicious details uh, are usually the same. Uh, you'll see poor text format, poor grammar, misspellings. Uh, a lot of times they're imposter designs of the emails or website, so you'll see issues or glitches within the layouts. Uh, a lot of times the information that's on there is a little generalized. They're not really calling you by name. They're uh, referring to you in general as a, just a, a person, uh, not usually by name. And then oftentimes there's usually a urgent call to action. Uh, I feel like everybody has seen this in some regard, whether it be a pop-up that says warning or important message or watch out, or if it's an email, it'll be like, send us this now or check your account right away. Uh, if you ever see any kind of urgent call to action right like that, I would recommend that you immediately be suspicious and start looking into the red flags uh, that that you may normally look towards. Uh, another little detail with emails, it's uh, relatively the same as well. Starting top to bottom, you're going to want to look at that sender and see if it's somebody you have prior business with. And again, if you look at the email address, you'll be able to see if they have any kind of imposter details. Uh, instead of it being google.com, it might say, uh, you know, Google with four O's. Just look for small details like that. Usually with websites and emails, it's all very much the same in how they attempt to dupe you. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. Similar to the last slide, uh, when dealing with the various vehicles of communications, internet and payment processing, uh, there are some rules or habits you can follow to maximize safety and uh, minimize the uh, uh, potential for compromise or data theft. Um, I'll try and keep this very simple. Uh, again, hopefully your eyes aren't crossing at this point. <laughs> uh, when dealing with these items, just try to remember the following. You should have previous business with the person, the site, or system you are dealing with. Um, I put in there no new friends uh, because it's highly unlikely that you're ever gonna dive right into divulging personal information or processing personal credentials or giving up payment to something or someone that you just encountered. It's, it's rare you're gonna receive an email or end up at a website and just do any one of these things and have no prior business. Uh, so in saying that, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you might have the question you know, what is this? What is this website? Or who is this person emailing me? Or what is this payment that they're asking for? If there is ever a single minor question in that regard, uh, then you need to, the second line there, verify, authenticate, and confirm, okay? Uh, simple, simple rule of, hey, do I have previous business? And if not, verify, authenticate, and confirm who that is. Uh, it seems relatively simple, but a lot of times in the heat of the moment, people forget. So if you can try and practice and remember to use those as triggers to slow you down, like, oh, who is this? Okay, let me go back through and make sure I've actually dealt with this person before. Uh, there's literally no reason to give information or financials or payments to anybody that you do not have some prior business with. Um, and then again, last but not least, golden rule, just never ever divulge information with absolutely knowing for sure who it is you're dealing with. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so common scams. Uh, I think we've all seen these, we, the, fake IRS, the fake IRS phone calls. Uh, usually it's pretty, uh, pretty obvious, right? You get a call from allegedly the IRS and they are demanding a tax payment with threat of potentially imprisoning you. Uh, I don't know which countries they may do that in, but they do not do that here in the United States. Uh, the IRS puts all their money into a lot of other things, one of them not being finding you to arrest you. So that is obvious uh, uh, a scam. One of the key details there though, that is common to other scams is the urgent call to action, right? They're trying to distract you and scare you with the idea of jail time 
to try to get you to be flustered and go right into giving them what they want. Uh, oftentimes in these calls too, they will attempt to obtain your social security number from you. All right, this is another common one. Uh, and this one has been surging even more so in the past uh, three years, the random phishing text. This has gotten so bad uh, that the likes of Apple, you know, iPhone maker uh, and, and various Android phones will now create filtered text messages uh, for you to filter out unknown text messages because they're coming out so, so much and so often. Uh, these phishing texts will usually look more like, uh, hey, is this you? Click on this link. Or, hey, is this your account? You're having account issues. Click on this link. They almost always include a link for you to click on. And nine times out of 10, when you click on that link, it will take you to an imposter website uh, in attempts to take credential information from you. Uh, this can very commonly be imposter bank website, imposter Facebook login. Uh, they, I would say there's no stone unturned there. They really do try everything. Lastly, urgent emails. We've all joked about this before where you get the email from, you know, the you know, royalty from another country asking you for help moving millions of dollars. Uh, I, I would like to believe that most people see that for what it is right away, but there are some people who might mess up and interact with that one. Uh, I would say email may be the easiest because we've all been dealing with it uh, for so long now. But uh, when you get emails asking for really absurd situations and information, obviously try and get rid of those emails as possible, uh, quick as possible and uh, ignore them and move on. Uh, also, actually, quick tip there with emails, anytime you encounter spam uh, or malicious attempt emails, don't just delete them. Move them to your junk or spam folder to help your email uh, detect future attempts. Uh, if they have the ability to report them for phishing, use that tool as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, to close it out here, we just have a few email examples. Uh, just go ahead and read over this email real quick and see if you can what you would look at in this email to authenticate it. All right, so I mentioned earlier when it comes to emails, using the top-down method and going line by line over the information to authenticate it is probably your best bet. Uh, no new friends, all right? Do I, have a, do I have previous business with this person? We look at the name, no-reply at google.support. Well, I've had a Google email for many years. Uh, I know that google.support is not the website name. It's google.com or gmail.com. So right away, I'm suspicious because that doesn't even look like a real domain name. And it also says someone has my password. Someone just used your password to try and sign in. Google stopped this attempt and they want me to change my password. That's interesting. Google never asks me to, to change my password this way. They usually just inform me of the attempt. Well, very quick thing, uh, you, actually, let me slow down here. I would say one of the number one tools that you can always use to your advantage that everybody has when it comes to verifying the safety of your email is simply hovering over any link or any button that is present in that email. When you hover over that link or that button, a tool tip will appear that shows you exactly where that link or button is gonna go. So if the link says www.google.com, but then you hover over it and it says www.justkidding.com, you know right away that's not a safe link to click. <laughs> In this case, if you were interacting with this email and you hovered over the change password button, you would see that instead of going to some google.com website that you may be familiar with, it's going to ml-security.org, which is very obviously not associated with Google. So you know right away to avoid this email. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Go ahead and look over that email. Now, <clears throat> being an example this is a little more generalized and not related to you, so it might be a little more difficult, but this is a very simple email to figure out if you're not familiar with who the person is, okay? If you look at the top and you see Luke Johnson, you have no new you have no idea who that is because your rule is no new friends, right? We move on to the one thing we can do, which is hovering over the links or the buttons that are present. This is letting us know that there is allegedly a Google document or a Word document 
that's being shared with us through what looks like the Google system. It's formatted as such, so your brain may default to that's what it is. It also says open in Docs. The Google tool and Google application for viewing documents is called Google Docs. But if we slow down for a second and be suspicious because we have no idea who Luke Johnson is, we hover over the button, we realize the link says drive-google.com. Well, you might get a little confused and say, well, I see google.com, so that must be a real domain. That must be it. But that's not how domains work. A domain can only be separated by a period, making it a primary domain or a subdomain. So you see the word drive, and then you see two dashes there, not a period. So it says drive-google.com. That is the primary domain, drive-google, not google.com. Now, if it said drive.google.com, that would be a genuine Google domain. But in this case, it is two dashes, thus making it a suspicious email, and we avoid it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Go ahead and take a look at this email. All right, again, <clears throat> This is not related to us because it is, it is an example system, but we can still try to use it uh, as it is intended. We start with the top-down method. Again, no new friends. Do we know a Sharon Mosley? Uh, sounds familiar, actually. She might be a part of the school that my kids go to. But upon further investigation, I look at the URL in their email address, and I notice that uh, that doesn't look right. Westmountdayschool.org. Not familiar with that. Usually, the website is westmountschool.org. So right away, an imposter email address has been identified through the domain name. Uh, I really want to emphasize this detail. When you're looking at your emails to try and figure out if they are safe or not, n there are many, many times where you don't even have to get past the sender because the sender in the name is going to have details that are obviously erroneous or, or suspicious. Uh, so I cannot emphasize that enough. Always start with that first line because it can save you a lot of time and help you very quickly know if that email is safe or not. Now, if we move on, we see that they have provided an attachment. So because we realized that the name was false and it was an imposter name, we're not even going to mess with the attachment. And as far as attachments go, I'd like to say this again, We've all been dealing with email for a long time, and we've all heard the stories about attachments since the beginning of time. Uh, if we've all been around with you know, Windows 98 and XP, we definitely remember the apocalypse that was opening attachments and the viruses they carried. Uh, when it comes to attachments, I always tell people, if you cannot wager something incredibly important to you, on opening that attachment and it infecting your computer, then just don't open it. It's, it's not worth it. What, what kinds of payloads that can be delivered to your machine are absolutely not worth it. So just always, always be weary when you open the email and it has an attachment. Make sure you, sorry, make sure you absolutely verify and authenticate who that person is before you touch that attachment and save yourself a lot of trouble. Next slide, please. And that's all for uh, my main bit on data protection and account security for you. Um, if you have issues, uh, you know, and need uh, reset passwords on impacted accounts, uh, these are the people you can contact. Um, if you want to get a free credit report every year, you can get one at annual, uh, annualcreditreport.com. If you ever experience any kind of fraud or identity theft, or you have any issues regarding uh, your uh, credit files, and the information that appears on them. This is the information to contact Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And uh, if you have any more information, or if you need any more information, please visit our website at lapfcu.org security. And that is all I have. You guys have a great night. All right, thank you, Wade, Russell, Jordan. And at this time, we'd like to open up the Q&A section for those that have questions. I actually see some that are already here. So I can go ahead and fire those off and gentlemen, feel free to chime in uh, if this is relevant to you. 
Uh, somebody asked, how can I make sure I'm not sharing too much information online? Um, well, I would say there's a, a, a number of different things. I would say in general, uh, you want to avoid uh, putting too much PII or, or, you know, information that could link directly back to you. Um, I know, you know, a lot of people might use a different version of their of their last name. Another thing I could um, definitely advise is it's always good to not post this stuff in real time. Uh, you know, if you want to post some pictures of your vacation, uh, don't do it while you're on vacation because uh, while identity theft is a huge issue, also somebody could realize that you're not home uh, based on that information and then, you know, maybe maybe target your house. Uh, another thing I would recommend is uh, it's also a good practice to set up uh, a completely separate email address, uh, one that you're using for your social media accounts, your online accounts that you're not using for things like online banking, um, and things like that. So those would be a couple of maybe of, of the less obvious, obvious ones that I could share. Awesome. Thanks, Russell. Are there any regulatory changes on the horizon that might impact online privacy and identity theft prevention efforts? Uh, I would say probably the big one, and uh, Jordan did touch on this, uh, and I don't foresee uh, it happening this year necessarily, uh, but I think at some point we will uh, see some type of national regulation uh, related to data breach notification. Now, this is going to have more of an impact on uh, the organizations that are housing your information than the actual consumer, uh, but right now each state has their own law, so there's a lot of different requirements in what the companies uh, need to do in order to protect your information. I do expect we'll see stricter, more uniform regulations across the country, but I expect that's something that might happen in the next five years rather than in, in the next year. Can disclosing my phone number to an unknown person provide them with enough info to find me? Uh, can you say that again, Daniel? Yeah, can disclosing my phone number to an unknown person provide them with enough information to find me? Uh, generally, the phone number, uh, I would say, is not enough. However, these fraudsters are very good at maybe infiltrating different systems as well. So if they do have your phone number, they're, uh, I guess, one step closer to the next system they hack into. Uh, the phone number itself, uh, as an isolated piece of information, uh, you know, not as much can be done with just that. It's not as risky as, say, your social security number getting in the wrong hands. Got it. And, and, and Russ, just to piggyback off of that, oftentimes, um, similar to what I mentioned in uh, in terms of synthetic identity fraud, you know, like a phone number is just one piece of PI. Well, I, I can't even really call it PII, but a, a piece of a person's identity. Oftentimes, there's pieces of ide a person's identity that are a little bit more impactful or, or you know, stronger, like for, like Russ mentioned, a social security number. Um, it, it's, it really becomes dangerous as if they, if a criminal has a lot of these different pieces of information on you to use in tandem. Awesome. Next question is, uh, my district was a victim of a cyber attack and my info was on the dark web. What should I do now other than the free credit monitoring that was provided? Uh, one thing you definitely can do, uh, I'm assuming you're our credit union member uh, if you're on the webinar, but one thing you can do is call into our resolution center. Uh, they'll be able to, we'll be able to set you up with one of our fraud specialists at Sontic. They'll be able to diagnose your unique situation and follow through with it until uh, all threats are minimized. So uh, that's exactly what we're here for to do. Um, so, uh, I'm assuming Daniel is going to be distributing these slides. You'll have access to the phone number to call into our restoration team. And that's a benefit that you have access to as part of your credit union. Absolutely. And then there was a question about that too. So, um, we will be providing this entire presentation to you after, um, most likely latest tomorrow. So you'll have every single slide and every piece of information on this uh, presentation tonight. Um, how do I manage passwords for over 80 accounts? Uh, I would say there's actually some tools that you can use 
uh, for that. We do have that embedded into our dashboard if you do choose one of the upgraded packages, but uh, a password manager is definitely good for that. Um, and, you know, in general, I would say it's sometimes easier to reset a password if you need to, rather than, you know, take the easy way out and make all of your passwords the same. That really is what puts you at risk is when you're reusing these passwords. Are there any quick fix quick fixes I can do right now to protect me online? One of the easiest ones I would say would be to place a fraud alert or a credit freeze on your credit reports. Uh, one of, you know, of course, uh, the biggest things that uh, remains prevalent in, in identity theft is, you know, someone trying to open a new account in your name. So while it's gotten a lot more diverse over the years, uh, that's still one of the main, you know, quick attacks that people try to do is, you know, let me open up a loan, spend a couple bucks before the individual notices. So uh, you can place a fraud alert or a credit freeze on your credit report. Uh, our specialists can help walk you through that process as well. Uh, if you do want to call into Sontic. Uh, and that really goes a long way in stopping some of the more simple financially based attacks in particular. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how my cell phone number got on a credit report. I have a common name. I believe someone else has a similar name. Every month I get about 50 calls from realtors. Apparently my number is embedded in an MLS. How can I correct this cell number? Uh, that's another thing our resolution center can definitely provide support with. Uh, you know, as Jordan and I both mentioned, uh, synthetic identity theft on this call where uh, essentially a new identity is getting created. Uh, situations where information gets crisscrossed, while well, it's not necessarily identity theft, uh, it can be just as frustrating and damaging as I'm sure you're going through. So uh, that's absolutely something that we can help with in our resolution center as well, uh, if you do want to give a call and speak with a specialist. Awesome. I get lots of phone calls from vacation clubs who want me to buy on the spot for future use. How can I know if they're legitimate? Uh, Wade or Jordan, did you guys want to touch on that or? I'm sorry, what was the question again? I get lots of calls from vacation clubs who want me to buy on the spot for future use. How can I know if they are legitimate? Uh, oftentimes, uh, when I receive calls like that, if it is something that may potentially interest me, um, I ask for their website information and I let them know that I'll call them back when I am uh, ready to talk with them. When I get off the phone with them, then I go to the website and I attempt to verify the information. You can usually do this by checking the website, deciding if it seems safe and legit. Uh, you can also look for reviews for their business. You can go to the Better Business Bureau. Uh, and you can use the various resources out there that will let you know if that business is legit. But uh, main point, it is best to get their information and let them know you will contact them back, giving you the chance to verify if they are real or not. Thanks, Wade. Is it a good practice to not give out personal information over the phone? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, a long, uh, I was asked this recently, and a long time I was a long time ago. I was in a situation where I had to uh, transition jobs, and I'm sure many people are familiar familiar with this. You start talking with recruiters, and they start contacting you. Uh, one time, I had a recruiter contact me, and they seemed legit. They provided a you know good good job requisition, all the right information, everything felt real. But then they asked me for my social security number. Uh, no. Honest practicing business will ever ask you for any kind of sensitive information like that over the phone uh, unless you, again, have already previously met with them and have business with them in person or have a valid account with them that they have authenticated. So best practice, always avoid giving out personal information over the phone if you can. Thank you, sir. Are those password manager apps truly safe and secure? If so, which ones can you recommend? I uh, I do want to touch on this, but I do think uh, Russell or Jordan mentioned uh, there might be one offered in their product. Uh, just in general, though, we can't recommend this kind of information to you. However, same uh, with 
uh, checking in on a business to see if it's safe and secure. Any well-known and well-used password manager out there, and there are quite a few, there will be plenty of reviews and information out there to help you verify if it's a good one to use. Thanks, Wade. And uh, any tips on how to protect home title theft? Yeah, I can go ahead and take this one. Um, I guess uh, I don't want to say that it's not uh, a problem in that, you know, obviously of all the assets that anyone has in their name, their home is uh, pretty much always going to be the most valuable one. Um, but I don't think that this type of fraud occurs as much as maybe some people think it does. Uh, you know, we have millions of members. We take uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of calls every year, and we maybe get one or two calls a year about anyone that has any type of uh, threat going on with this, and we're usually able to remediate and, and squash the issue as well. So uh, there's really a lot of different types of checks and balances that go into this, and I know there's some companies that specialize in providing home title monitoring, uh, but it's really one of the most rare types of fraud that we see actually processing actual claims. Um, so I know that might not answer your question, but um, just to give you a little more context, it's it's one of the most rare types of identity theft that, that does occur. So it's not necessarily uh, an issue that we're seeing uh, a lot of cases of like we are with some of the other types of fraud that we mentioned earlier. Thanks, Russell. And there was a question and answer in the chat, but I, I'm not sure if everybody can see it. So I'm going to share it with the group and wait if you can chime in. Is security at facebookmail.com legit? I just got an email that looked like the first one mentioned in the slides uh, about resetting a password. At the bottom of the email is the meta infinity symbol. Uh, so, <clears throat> as I mentioned in there, uh, just for legal reasons, we can't answer uh, what is real and what is not with that company and that domain name. Uh, although I can assure you, if you search that question with that email address, you can uh, find the answer on their actual website. Just make sure you for sure are on facebook.com uh, when you're reading that answer. Um, and then when it comes to uh, resetting passwords in general, it there are various ways that companies will ask you to do that. Um, if you want to do it in the safest way possible, if a company sends you an email that says, hey, it's time to change your password, and they provide you a button to do so, I would avoid clicking the button and then just log directly in to wherever that account or that app is and go to the password reset feature. Uh, that minimizes greatly uh, the the potential for you clicking on an imposter link and giving away that information. Thanks, Wade. If you have all three credit reporting agencies frozen or locked, is that enough to keep fraudsters from draining draining investment bank and credit union accounts? Uh, it, it's definitely a good first step. Uh, I would also take steps in you know monitoring the accounts themselves and. Uh, you know, while it's rare, occasionally a fraudster will also have enough to uh, actually lift a freeze. You know, generally, when you place a freeze on, you set up a PIN number with the Bureau. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have your PIN, there's other steps that you can take to unfreeze it. You know, you'll have to provide a copy of your ID, provide a utility bill, uh, answer some security questions. Depending on the well, the, the savvy that the fraudster has, they might have all that information. So, you know, even if you do do that, it's still important to make sure you've got an eye on your stuff, either through a monitoring service or uh, on a semi-frequent basis, just, uh, you know, keeping an eye on everything. So uh, it's definitely a good first step, but, you know, these fraudsters are getting more and more complex as time goes on. So, um, you know, it's always good to be kind of keeping an eye on everything and doing everything you can. Awesome. And it looks like we are done with questions. Um, so once again, thank you, Wade, Jordan, and Russell for um, being a panelist on our webinar tonight. And to the attendees, just another reminder, this will be sent to you uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning. So you'll have the entire presentation that you can review and um, contact us anytime. Sontix information is there. 
So if you do have a um, issue that you need resolved, please feel free to reach out to them and let them know you're an LAPFCU member. All right. Um, have a good night. I'm giving you guys some time back. Have a great evening, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for your time tonight, everyone.